welcome. We are glad that you are here today. If I haven't had the opportunity to meet you, allow me just to quickly introduce myself. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. You met Pastor Reese earlier as he welcomed us, and we are thrilled that you are here today to be with us, to worship our great God together, to hear from his word. We are in week seven of a sermon series entitled Parables, where we are specifically looking at some of the teachings of Jesus um, this method that he's, he used, parables, these earthly stories to reveal heavenly realities. And before we jump into our next parable, I just want to remind us, like Pastor Reese mentioned earlier, today is a great day to start our Christmas gift drive in encouraging and supporting the Bridge Academy and Community Center. I would highly encourage you and, and ask if you would go ahead and, and grab one of those children out there and not only just buy a gift for that child, but spend the next season over Thanksgiving, over Christmas, hang that, that card on your refrigerator, hang it in your mirror in the bathroom, and every time you see that card, pray for that child. Pray that God's love would be revealed to that child. Pray that, that they would have eyes to see just how much Jesus loves them and that they would place their faith and trust in him. One of the things that we could do with the Bridge Academy and Community Center is, is by providing these gifts, it helps that ministry to continue to build relationships with the families and the students there in Coatesville. And so you have, in a way, an indirect uh, support system for the Bridge Academy as they go into that neighborhood and they reach every child that they can to equip those students for leadership, for academic skills, for spiritual vitality. And so I would highly encourage you and ask that you would do that. I also want to let you know in a couple of weeks, on December 1st, mark that on your calendar, we're going to do a little bit of a year in review here for Mission Community Church. Uh, in the past, I've done that in the new year, but I'm actually going to just switch it and do it on December 1st, that Sunday before we launch into our Christmas season. So if you don't have any plans on that Sunday morning, I invite you to come back and just hear all that God has done in this new year, some of the things that we're hoping for God to do in the, in the upcoming year. And then starting December 8th, we'll launch into our Christmas series, five Sundays until Christmas. Anybody freaking out? A week and a half until Thanksgiving. If you are listening to Christmas music right now, you are not saved. You have to wait until after Thanksgiving. Yes, I hear you. Yes, I need someone to help me preach today. Every store I go into, I'm assaulted with Christmas music. I'm just kidding. It's not that bad. But I do, I like Colleen's been begging me to put up Christmas decorations around the house. I said, nope, nope, not until after Thanksgiving. Sorry, babe. Sorry. That's just a rule. Stay strong. I'm, I'm, I need that encouragement. So if she ends up coming after me, I'm coming after you, Jared. So... Yeah, uh, December 1st, mark that on your calendar, and then December 8th, we'll start our Christmas series, and looking forward to, to seeing what God will do through that. Hey, if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. I typically read from the English Standard Version, so if you have a mobile device, you can pull up that version on your mobile device. Uh, if you have, you know, an NIV or a New Living Translation or King James Version, it's all pretty close, but English Standard Version is my preferred version Reading from Luke chapter 10, we're going to tackle the parable of the Good Samaritan this morning. Fascinating interaction that, that takes place here in Luke chapter 10. Start in verse 25. Listen to what it says. And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him, put Jesus, that is, to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? How do you interpret it? What do you see? And so the Lord answered him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, ding, 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 you got it. So go and do this and you will live. Fascinating interaction. You have this, this lawyer, it's it's not really a lawyer as we think of lawyer today. It's more of an expert of the law, an expert of the religious law. And so here you have this collision with an expert of the law and the law itself, with Jesus. He is not only the expert of the law, but he's also the expert of love. So you have this interaction that takes place. This lawyer asks the question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? 
the age-old question, the question I imagine that each of us have wrestled with at some point or another, and, and that takes different shapes and different forms. You know, what do I need to do to, to be in right standing with God? What do I need to do to, to gain peace? And so in, in true Jesus fashion, he responds to the lawyer's question by asking a question for himself. He says, well, you're an expert of the law. You're a, a lawyer. What does the law say? How do you interpret it? And, and so immediately the, the lawyer, the expert of the law, goes to the, the Shema. This is taken out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This was a, a daily prayer that the, the Jews used to pray both morning and evening to remind them the most important thing about the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And then out of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, he says, then love your neighbor as yourself. So as you have the law, as you have the Ten Commandments, and then later the Torah, in which there's over 600 laws that the Pharisees and the religious leaders put in place in order to maintain the Ten Commandments, the, the summation of that law, if you were to summarize all of it, it's love God and love people. Love God and love people. Now, I remember that when growing up, you know, I, I've, I've shared this before, that I have a brother. He's 15 months younger than I am. So me and my brother, we, we did everything together. And, and we were so close in age that we had the same friend groups that we would hang out with. We, we participated on the sports or the same sports teams. And, and so there was always a sibling rivalry that would happen. And with me being the older brother, there's no way I could let my younger brother outdo me in anything. And if he was getting to the point where he was outdoing me in, in anything or in something, I would, I would do something to, to hurt him, to harm him, to put him in his place. And then that would turn into what? A fight. So, you know, we're upstairs playing nicely and getting along, and then all of a sudden it, it turns into a little bit of like a wrestling competition, and then before long you're biting the bottom lip and you're punching, you're scratching, and my mom would yell, hey, knock it off. You treat each other the way you want to be treated. Like that's, that's really the law. That's really the summation of, of the Shema in this verse in Leviticus chapter 19, that, that love God and then love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor the way in which you would want to be loved. Pretty simple. And then Jesus says to him, great, you, you answered correctly. Now go do it. Listen to what the lawyer says in verse 29. But he... Desiring to justify himself. Here is this lawyer looking for a loophole. Desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now this is a fascinating question. Because the lawyer is asking, when he says, who is my neighbor, asks the question, who is my neighbor? That Greek word neighbor literally means anyone other than yourself. And so he's asking this question, and who is my neighbor? It's almost like, what do you mean who is your neighbor? Like the word neighbor itself implies anybody other than you. And so he's looking to justify himself. He, he's looking for the loophole. It's an obvious answer, but, but he, wants, he wants to get around it. Do I, do I, have, to, do I have to love the person who, who is different from me? Do I, have to, do I have to love the person who listens to the wrong kind of music, the person that listens to the old Kanye, not the new Kanye? Do I have to love the person who, who is less educated than me? Do I have to love the person, if I'm white collar, who's blue collar? Or if I'm blue collar, who's white collar? Or if you're blue or white collar, who's no collar? Do I have to love the person who has a different religious background, tradition, denomination? Do I have to love a different person who speaks a different language, who has a different ethnicity, who has a different color skin. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Now it's interesting because what Jesus responds with is this parable. And, and he's actually answering the question, or I should say he's not only answering the question, who is my neighbor? But he's also answering the question, how do you neighbor? So it's not just a matter of who, but it's a matter of how. 
So then we dig into the parable of the Good Samaritan. We pick it up in verse 30. Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and as he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he had saw him, he (whistles) passed by on the other side of the street. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw this man beaten up, bruised, battered, abandoned on the side of the road, passed by on the other side of the street. So here's this Jewish man. He's leaving Jerusalem, going down to Jericho. This is about an 18-mile journey. It's, it's a 3,300-foot descent through winding trails and rocky trails. It was perfect for thieves and robbers to lay in wait for that unsuspecting person to lay ambush. Now, now we typically think like, okay, 18 miles isn't that big of a deal. We hop in our car and we travel to King of Prussia. It's not, it's not that bad. But for a person in that day traveling 18 miles, it would typically take several days for that person to get to the destination. And so they would bring more than just themselves. They would often bring food and, and wealth and treasures to help accommodate any type of unsuspecting purchases that come up along the way. And so this was a, a perfect trail for robbers and thieves to lay in wait and ambush the unsuspecting victim, which kind of alludes to the, that we're all on this journey. We're all going from here to there, from point A to point B, and, and this world is not our home. We're just passing through, and along the way, there's going to be some windy twists and turns. There's going to be some rocky terrain. There's going to be some ups and downs, and, and it's this picture of, hey, we're all on this journey. And it's going to get difficult. There's going to be the robbers and the thieves that come up and beat us up and, 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 and strip off all of our clothes, leave us abandoned, desperate, in need. A priest passed by and a Levite. To, to kind of put that in today's context, you could say that, that a, a pastor passed by and then a Levite, a Levite back in those days were responsible for the, the corporate worship within the temple. And so let's say Jason passed by somebody on the, on the road who was bruised and, and banged up and battered. I, I passed on the other side of the road and, and Emily or Todd who are leading us in corporate worship, they pass by that same person and they go to the other side of the road. So here are people who are knowledgeable of the law, love God, love people, yet for some reason they they pass by on the other side of the road, and and they're Jewish nonetheless. So here's this beaten up, battered, bruised dude on the, the side of the road in the ditch who is a Jew, and your fellow Jew, your fellow pastor, your fellow worship leader, your fellow ministry leader, your church staff looks at you and keeps walking. Here's the context of what's happening here. And there's, there's this tension that, that rises up. There's this expectation that, that the priest and the Levite, they, they should have done something. And, and I can feel that sometimes even as a pastor. When, when you hear about some sort of a hurt or some sort of a need in the church, and, and before you know it, you get sucked into the, the everyday routine of life, and you forget to reach out to that person, you forget to, to visit that person, you feel this tension. I feel this tension that rises up like, oh, you, you should have done this or you should have done that. And, and I can kind of relate here. But this one here, in this context, it's a little bit more of a, it's a little bit more of a purposeful avoidance. You, you see the person beat up, battered, busted on the side of the road, and you walk to the other side, completely avoiding that person. I love what Paul says, like, when, when he, he knows the things that he ought to do, but he doesn't do it, and the things that he knows he shouldn't do, he does do, it's like this, it's the most schizophrenic passage in all of the Bible. So Romans chapter 7, it says this, And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't, but I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyways. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really doing what, anything wrong. This sin that's living and resides in me. I've discovered this principle in life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. <sighs> Can anybody relate? You know that, yeah, one person, one person. We got a bunch of perfect people here. So, so we recognize the things that we ought to do, but we don't do those things that we ought to do. And then the things that we know we're not supposed to do, we end up doing those things anyways. The tension that we all 
wrestle with and live with each and every day. You see, the priests and the Levite, they, they saw this poor Jewish man banged up on the side of the road, but they did not act. You know, it's one thing to see, it's another thing to, to act. And there's thousands of excuses to, to perhaps even try to justify themselves. And, and I would even say today that not only do we try to justify ourselves by asking who is our neighbor, but we also try to justify ourselves by saying, to what extent should I neighbor? So we see the person who's beat up, broken, busted on the, on the street corner holding a cardboard sign asking for money, asking for food, and, and what do we justify in our minds? Oh, they're going to take my money and spend it on cigarettes or spend it on alcohol or, or spend it on, on drugs. We, we justify in our minds why we won't help that person. Or, or the hitchhiker who's, who's going down the, the side of the road and we're driving down the interstate and we see him a, a mile away and, and we begin to justify in, my, in our heads. If I pull over, he's going to stab me in the throat, steal my car, and take off with all my stuff. We, we justify in our minds why we will or won't do. We, we see the person who's in our neighborhood and the, the house is in shambles. Everything's overgrown. There's moss on the roof, little plants out of the gutters. And we, we know we ought to go over and just try to lend a hand, but, but we justify because, well, I've got my own yard work to do. It, it's fall. I got leaves everywhere that I need to get up before it starts to snow. I, I got to pressure wash my own house. Like we, we have these reasons why we don't, Take that step. It's the churchy justification. It's when we see someone who's in a, in a really bad spot, a really difficult position, we, we begin to ask the question, okay, he must have done something, she must have done something in order to get to that spot. You got to learn from your mistakes. It's tough love. But you you got to learn from your mistakes. You see, we want to make the issue complex and philosophical, but Jesus just makes it simple and practical. Here's a need, meet it. Now, when Jesus is telling this story, he, he first mentions this priest and this Levite that walks by this battered up man on the side of the road. But then it's interesting because he says in verse 33, but a Samaritan. Now, we have to understand the, the weight of, of those three words right there, but a Samaritan. You see, Jews hated, hated, hated Samaritans. And because Jews hated Samaritans, what's the response? Samaritans hated Jews. I mean, there were 700 years of this pent-up anger between Jews and Samaritans. And where that comes from is that when the, when the Jewish people were exiled, there were some Jews that intermingled with pagan peoples in the area. And that was a, a big no-no for the Jewish people. And so here you had people that were, were marrying these, these pagan worshipers and, and brought in their pagan gods. And, and so the Jewish people, the devout Jews, they would look at these, these half-breeds and they would call them Samaritans. It was very tense between Jews and Samaritans. That for Jewish people, in order to get south into, into Israel and Jerusalem, they would go around Samaria so that they wouldn't come into contact with Samaritans. Now, to be called a Samaritan in that day would be equivalent to some of the racial slurs that are used today. Now, I, I prayed all week whether or not I should just sprinkle out some of those slurs. Think about some of those for a minute. Like if I were to say, or if I were to say this person is a, kind of feel that tension a little bit. Like even when you're not calling the person that, that racial slur, but you're even just to say it in this type of a context as an illustration, there's like, can I say that? Can I use that? This would have been the tension when Jesus said to this lawyer, but a Samaritan, it would have immediately went, Ugh. what? What are you getting at? There was this hatred, hatred between Jews and Samaritans, but a 
Samaritan. It's interesting, this, this, uh, this, this racism that came between the Jews and the, the Samaritans. It was 700 years boiling up, boiling over, and yet Jesus goes ahead and goes to that topic, uses this example to, to point out to this expert of the law, hey, if you really want to gain eternal life, you love God and you love people, and this is who you have to love. You love those who are your enemies, you love those who you hate, but it's interesting because when we talk about this topic of, of racism, uh, actor Dennis Leary, he, he says this, it's a great quote. He says, racism isn't born, folks. It's taught. I have a two-year-old son. You know what he hates? Naps. I have three kids, 10, 8, and 6. You know what they hate? Vegetables. He's getting to the point that, that racism is this taught experience. It's not, it's not something, there's no racism gene. There's nothing that makes us inherently racist. This is something that is taught, that is developed, that is, is grown over time. That when it comes to racism, racism isn't a skin issue. It's a sin issue. Racism isn't a skin issue. It's a sin issue. We jump back up. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And instead of walking on the other side of the street, he went to him. What did he do? He went to him. He crossed the street and bound his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, then set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. I've used this, this word before, but that word compassion, it's probably my, my favorite word in all of the Greek to say. Splachnizomai. Why, why don't you go ahead and say that with me? Splachnizomai. All right, get in there. One more time. Splachnizomai. Got to get a little bit of that phlegm going in the back of your throat. This word, splachnizomai, it's a fascinating word. It literally means to be moved by the bowels. Yeah, yeah so you know when, when you have that upset stomach and it doesn't matter what you're doing, what you're in the middle of, when that urge comes, you're moved by the bowels. Do you know what I mean? Splachnizomai, this is what this word compassion means. It's not just a, a good thought. It's not just a, a good intention. It's a, it's a compassion. It's a love that compels someone to action. It causes that person to cross the street. It causes the good Samaritan to go to him, to go to him, to, to bind up his wounds, to care for for him, true compassion always compels you to action. This is how you neighbor. It's not a matter of who is my neighbor. It's a matter of how do you neighbor. It's, it's simply seeing a need and meeting that need. When, when someone needs food, you bring them food. When someone needs some clothes, you take him or her shopping and get that person some Clothes. When someone needs a, a warm cup of coffee, you bring that person a warm cup of coffee. When someone needs some yard work done because they're unable to do it themselves, you go and do that yard work and you do them themselves. Even to the extreme that if you see a complete stranger who is different from you and you see a need, you go and meet that need. This is what compassion is. True compassion always compels you to action. Verse 35, and the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will pay you when I come back. If you're with us last week, we spent a little time just discussing what a denarii is, and, and if you remember, a denarii during that day was a, was a day's wage. And so when you look at you know, just wages here in Chester County, the average income per person is about $68,000. That equals to about $260, $270 a day. So two denarii, let's say it's about five to $600. This is what this person gave to help care for this person. 
Now, it's interesting because when I was researching this and studying it this week, in that day, the, the whole concept of an inn was fairly new. Like, we're not talking about, like, the Holiday Inn Express or, or Comfort Inn and Suites. It's not like that. It was basically bare bones, whatever you could do to provide shelter for someone. They started popping up. And so the cost to, to be at an inn was about one thirty second of a denarii. So we're talking about 16, 17 bucks a day. So here's a guy who, who gives two denarii, two days worth of wages. We're talking about a month's worth of care in this inn, in this hotel. Which shows me that, that he, he's not just about crossing the street. He's also about signing the checks. That he's about doing whatever needs to be done to care for that person, to make sure that that person is bound up and, wo- and, and wound-free and healed. And so after Jesus finishes this parable, he once again answers the Lord's question with another question. Verse 36. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? The lawyer said, this expert of the law the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said to him, you're correct. Now go and do likewise. So again, yes, love God, but also love people. Now if you remember back to the beginning when the lawyer asks, who is my neighbor, trying to justify himself, trying to to find the loophole, trying to figure out, okay, to what extent do I actually have to neighbor Jesus flips it completely around and and says that the neighbor isn't the one who's critical on the side of the road. The neighbor is the one who cares for the one who's critical on the side of the road. The neighbor isn't the one who's busted up, beaten, and broken. The The neighbor is the one who actually does something for the person who's busted up, beaten, and broken. So it's not a matter of who is my neighbor, but the question that Jesus turns back on the lawyer, he says, how are you neighboring? How do you neighbor, the one who showed mercy, the one who had compassion, the one who was compelled to action, that is the neighbor. You know, in probably one of his most famous sermons, one of his most famous speeches, Dr. Martin Luther King says this about the Good Samaritan. He says, the first question the priest and the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the Good Samaritan reversed the question. He flipped the question. If I don't stop and help this man, what will happen to him? It's all a matter of perspective. That the question isn't, who is my neighbor? The word neighbor suggests everyone is your neighbor. Anyone other than yourself, that is your neighbor. But Jesus takes it a step farther and he says, how do you neighbor? And so when we look at this parable of the Good Samaritan, there are, there are kind of three things that immediately stand out to, to how we can go about neighboring those around us, those who are, are different from us. And I think the first thing is just to, to recognize prejudices. Just to recognize prejudices. That that idea of prejudice, that there's a preconceived opinion not based on reason or actual experience. And so you, you know some of those kind of funny prejudices that we put out there, that, that rich people are snobs, millennials are lazy, old people can't drive, white guys can't jump. There's, the, there's those types of prejudices. But the, to recognize that there are prejudices that are ingrained in our society, ingrained in our culture, ingrained in our institutions, and we need to just take time and and recognize those prejudices. I think the second thing we ought to do is seek understanding. So those who are different from us, those who grew up differently from us, those who have a different education from us, those who are from a a different socioeconomic background from us, we, we seek to understand. We enter into conversations. You know, one of the things that Colleen and I do in our premarital counseling with couples that are getting ready to get married is, is we spend a lot of time fo- focusing on communication. And like, if you can get your communication to a, a good, healthy spot now, it's going to help you in years and years to come. And I always go to James 1.19. So James 1.19, it says this, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak. 
quick to hear and slow to speak. That God gave you two ears and one tongue. So be quick to hear, listen double as much as you speak. Be quick to hear, slow to speak. Let's seek understanding. Let's enter into conversations. Let's listen twice as much as we speak. So we recognize prejudices. We seek understanding. And number three, love everyone. Just love everyone, including those who are different from you. And some would even suggest, especially those who are different from you. Cross the street. Cross the street. When you see a need, meet the need. Racism is a skin issue. It's not, I'm sorry, is a sin issue, not a skin issue. The, the writer of Galatians, the Apostle Paul says this, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all in one in Christ Jesus. That God loves African Americans, Asian Americans, Latino Americans, Native Americans, even Americans who root for the New England Patriots. God loves all those American. God loves Cubans and Singaporeans and Swiss and Irish. God loves all people because he is the creator of all people. That one day heaven will be a haven of ethnically diverse people. There's this amazing revelation that John receives in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Listen to this. He says, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. You cannot number these, these people from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God. Salvation belongs to our God. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and is the lamb. There is only one race. It's the human race. And Jesus Christ gave his life for the human race. And so Jesus, he, he not only answers the question, who is my neighbor?